Um, I sent out the lesson again earlier today, so if you want to pull that out on your phones or your devices, you can. If not, we're going to be on Luke chapter 13. Yeah. My first question is, just coming up to tonight, is do you know what a paradigm shift is? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. A paradigm shift, give me an example, it's kind of like a, a, a situation, a blind man, he gets on the bus and someone gives up their seat for him. Did they do the good, a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Good thing, usually, right? Mm. But the man was the driver. Oh. Bad. <laughs> so a paradigm shift is when you have a complete change in thought in just one motion. Where at first it was a good thing, but now it's a bad thing. Yep. In that same way, most of our Christian lives, we are searching for that kind of change in our own life. We read here in Luke chapter 13, verse 10 through 12. About somebody who gets this change in their own in individual lives. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. It talks about this woman was crippled for 18 long years. Think of anything that you have suffered through for that long. Some of us are just like over 18, you know, in this room. Like for 18 years, meaning it didn't say actually in this scripture that it was her whole life, right? It didn't say for all of her life she suffered for this. Meaning that she would have remembered a time before suffering. Wow. Which is something that, that's, that's interesting about this. Yo, know, she may have even got to the point though, 18 years? She had maybe even got to the point where she described her disability as permanent. But that is not how Jesus saw it. You know, sometimes whenever we suffer for a long time, there's a saying, the longer we suffer, the more hope that we lose. You know, have you ever started to be in like this, this situation just as a woman? Have you ever found yourself saying to yourself or others, I, I can never change that. That is just who I am. Mm. This thing in me is permanent. You know, and, and that's something that as Christians, we always have to learn how to develop out, out, out of. I know for me, growing up, that before I became a Christian, I always thought that this was true, that for the longest, that no one can change. See, in my life, I always saw people that they would alter their behaviors or they would alter things, but they would fall in the same cycle of pain or same cycle of you know faults or same cycle of mistakes. And I always just grew my heart. No, nobody can ever change. And even before I became a Christian, that all changed when I saw one of my good friends turn into a Christian, I know I talked about this previously, my friend Desiree, you know, before she was drinking, smoking and everything, and then I saw her change, I'm like, wait, this, this, this is different than what I believe. Mm. This is different than what I think. And so it, it, it almost had this paradigm shift in my mind, like, wait, people can change. People can change than, than what I thought. You know, we all know these sayings, like, when the going gets tough, the... Tough, tough gets going. going. The tough go to God. Yes. Uh, so so we're, we're, we're going to be changing up some thoughts. And now if you don't read the, the text, you'll kind of not catch up on my, my little uh, craftiness here. But, you know, when we start looking at these different things of when the tough get going, yes, the tough need to turn to God. Mm -hmm. See, these opportunities, these tough, difficult tasks in our lives are just opportunities for God to show his power and his care for you. You know, consider the story of the child of Sarah and Abraham's, uh, which is Abraham's wife, in Hebrews eleven eleven, and by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. It's saying here that you know even Sarah had to go through this big change in her mind. Mm. That like everybody else, or like every, she could have seen herself like everyone else. Hey, I just can't have kids. I'm too old now. You know, we all know the saying: you can't teach old dogs how to have babies. How to have babies, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but in the same way, like Sarah had to change her mind. See, Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac, and most of us would be like, "That's not possible." But she changed her mind to say, "It's not just about me. It's the one who made the promise, and that is God." Mm. So my title tonight is, It's Never Too Late to Change. Mm. On, Point number one, time to straighten up. Mm. <laughs> Preach it, bro. Luke 13, we're going to continue with the story about this woman. Verses 11 through 13. 
is that she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. You know, there are always funny things when you look throughout the story of Jesus and throughout the Gospels. And I think this is one of those that, that's quite funny to me. You know, he calls her up and makes her walk to him. You know, kind of like this old woman kind of stretching instead of him coming to her. Now, you can possibly make this into a spiritual lesson where God calls you even though you're weak and you've got to get to him. But to be honest, I just saw this as funny. Like, why, why didn't Jesus just go to him? I don't know. Or go to her. But I just thought this was funny. But, you know, we continuously understand every single time, though, throughout Jesus' ministry, we continuously see and witness the, the miracles in the gospel, precisely healing was always done according to their faith. Right? right? In Matthew 8, 13, it says, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. Matthew 9, 29-30. Then he touched his eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. See, this is something we have to change in our hearts. Don't look at my, my, my lesson. But hope for the best and prepare for the... Worst. 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 But for God to work miracles. Mm. Come on. See, we got to start changing our mind how we're preparing for things. Yeah. See, God, Jesus, you know, accompanied or complimented her faith with his healing and healing her. You know, think about it, that she would have remained in her position if she didn't have faith of what he said what was going to happen. Meaning the moment that he touched her and said, it was going to be well, you are going to be set free. If she didn't believe that, it wouldn't have happened. See, to be set free means you need to believe in Jesus' word and not Satan's lies. Mm -hmm. See, if she didn't believe, she wouldn't have been set free. And I wonder if she actually would have been healed. See, it says this later on in verse 16 about her real situation. It says here in verse 16, then... Uh, then should not this woman, this is Jesus speaking here, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what has bound her? See, Jesus saw it something different. It wasn't just an infirmity, but Satan had her bound for 18 years. 18 years, she believed the lie that she couldn't straighten up. She believed the lie that God could not heal her. See, this woman was captive to Satan. And not just under his realm or anything, but precisely under his lies. Wow. Yet, why do you think Romans, we know the scripture in Romans 12, why do you think it tells us before we can actually test of God's perfect, pleasing, and good will, we have to what? We have to renew our minds. Yeah. Why doesn't it say we have to purify our hearts or dedicate our soul or, you know, get, get our actions moving. No, it's saying you gotta, you got to change your mind first before you can even see that God's will is perfect. Why? Because our minds manage so much in our lives. They say ideas can change the world. You know, see, if, if Satan rules your mind, then he rules your world. If you can change your mind, then you can change your Lord. That's how important it is to change your mind. See, Jesus believed that she could walk up straight. He said so and she did so. That was it. Yeah. That's all that needed to happen. Is that he said it and she did it. Mm. She believed it. See, too often the things that hold us back is not God, but the lies that we believe and act on. Instead of simply believing what the Bible says about us and acting on that. See, what lie does Satan have you under? What are traps or limitations you truly believe that you are not set free from? You know, the very first saint, uh, the very first lie that comes out of Satan's mouth is, God didn't say that. Right? God, God, God didn't say that. And even more so, she, he was talking to Eve, and Eve heard from uh, Adam of what God's command was. And that's sometimes where we get caught up too. Just because someone said it, like, well, that's, that's what my leader thinks. My leader believes in me, but I don't know if God believes in me. Right? That, that, that was even more so of what Satan was getting in there. And that can always get in our hearts. You know, there's common uh, lies that Satan wants us to believe as Christians. You know, you can't change who you are or what you are. 
Some people will reference the scripture, you know, well, you know, just like Paul, I have this thorn in my flesh. Sometimes people are like porcupines, though. You got too many thorns. You way too many thorns. Oh, this is a thorn in my flesh. That, no, no, you get one thorn in your flesh, okay? When you, give, when you do one thorn, everything else you can change. All right, everyone gets one thorn. We agree on that? Okay. Yeah. And so, so we can't believe that lie. Some lies is God doesn't love you, nor do people in the church. Everyone is looking at you and judging you. The world and worldly people around you are happier than you. You know, God doesn't answer your prayers, so why bother him? Well, God, God answered other people's prayers, but I don't think he'll answer them. Your goals in your life are too impossible and will end in disappointment. So why don't you just lower your goals or quit while you're ahead? Unless you take control out of God's hands and put your control of your own life in your hands, it, it won't go well. You, know, you, you don't need a church to be a Christian. You can do it on your own. Every single one in its different varieties is what Satan wants you to believe. See, mostly of what we're teaching here, every single lesson that I do, everything that we teach in the church is simply replacing the lies that Satan has taught you from the world. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to renew your mind. Get you to think more godly rather than worldly. And so most of the time, all we're trying to do is just wash our minds and hearts out from the world. You know, just kind of like how the world keeps saying, if you believe you can, if you believe you can't, you are misled. <laughs> Has nothing to do with what you believe you can or cannot do. It's what God says you can do. Come on. That's where we have to renew our minds with. Because only God can truly bring change into your lives. And I knew, I wrote this here even, I knew I was going to lose participation with you guys because you're like, whatever I say ain't going to be right anyway. <laughs> uh, but Jesus knew this as well, right? He had people believe in him and follow him, but he's going to call them to action and to do something different. John 8, 31 through 32. We know these scriptures. Mm. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What I love about this scripture is not just its application for those that we're studying the Bible with, but for its continual appliance in our own lives. See, when we study the Bible with somebody, we don't just call them to believe and just follow the Word of God. Uh, excuse me. That is why we don't just call people to, that study the Bible, we don't just call them to believe and follow the Word of God. Um, you know, if they're feeling faithless or under pressure from Satan's lies... We, decide, we tell them to decide to believe in God's word, right? Mm -hmm. we, we tell them to make a decision to actually do something about it. See, this is not a call to change or manage our feelings about how we feel about the word of God. But it's a call to change our actions and our lifestyles. See, I don't care what you say. All people, men included, are emotional beings. We're all very, very emotional. Um, and that can sometimes be used as an insult in today's world. Yep. Oh, you're just being emotional. You, you just have emotions. You're just full on emotions. But actually, emotions make life extremely beautiful. God gave us emotions. God gave these things as, as tools to help us get connected to Him. Yo, there's one lie that you have to stop believing, and that's the lie that emotions are bad or sinful. Emotions were created by God to help guide us to Him. Amen. See, we're studying the Bible with people, right? When you think about the very first scripture that we go to in Psalms 119, verse 1 and 2, it talks about, hey, well, hey, you know, blessedness, happy are those who, who seek God with all their heart. If someone that we're studying the Bible with says, hey, I'm not that happy, we don't challenge them, well, just be happy, like the, the Bible says. <laughs> like that. We don't say that. We say, oh, if you're not happy, well, maybe you need to start seeking God with your life. Your, your unhappiness is actually a good guidance of what you're doing so far. Don't just deny the unhappiness and just get joyful. No, you should change your life. In the same way, emotions are a beautiful guide when you actually take them for when they're bringing up in your life. Okay, if you're feeling sad or you're feeling angry, some of us can just well, uh, rejoice always. I can't feel that way. No, 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 no. Take that emotion and say, what is causing me to feel this way? Let, let me follow this somewhere real quick. Because then I can actually start to dig deeper in myself. Yeah. And that's what we don't like to do. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to say, no, I, I rejoice always. I'll just use that scripture. No, no, no. You, you, you 
follow that for a moment. Yes, you are called to rejoice, but you follow that for a moment. What is causing you to be unhappy? Let's get down to the basics of it and really change our lives and learn how to direct our emotions to God. Amen. See, each one of these things are different lies that God, uh, Satan wants us to be under. If he can have you in a bad position in your life, but he's just causing you to think that emotions are bad. So all you do is you just pretend like you're happy when you're not living the right way. And that's, that's, a great, that's a great scripture that Satan can use against you. Satan knows scriptures too, right? Yeah. Hey, just rejoice always. Don't change anything. Just rejoice always. Hey, don't be angry. Hey, this is, you know, the Bible says don't be angry. You shouldn't do that. that, that that's, that's what Satan wants you to do. Mm, come on, Sean. Point number one in the challenge is write down one lie you think that you are believing from Satan. I want you to pray about it every day for this week and just how God can help you change to understand the truth. Just want you to do simple things. Just pray about it every day of this week. Yeah. And just like, God, let, let me believe more in your truth rather than Satan's lies. Point number two, time to praise God. Come on, Sean. You know, how do you react when you see someone else succeed? Do you rejoice in their victories or criticize their favor? I, I should have been that, right? Well, we're going to see how these people react when they see this woman get lifted up by Jesus. Mm. Verse 14 through 16. It says, Indignant it because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall? And lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan had kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? You know, this kind of reminds me of like a bride freaking out just because the flowers were the wrong color. And some women might be like, well, Sean, you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, amen. Uh, okay. Break your brother. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the main point is you're missing the point, mm. right? Yeah. Mm, right. It, like, the, the, that, that's it. Like people were missing the point here. Have you ever got caught up on a small detail when instead you should be rejoicing? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Right. That's actually kind of why I love kingdom weddings. Aww. Have you seen a kingdom wedding? How disastrous sometimes it can be on the, on the back end of it. Yeah, Man, they're it was, yeah. It? I'm saying they don't wedding. see it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's the beautiful part of it. And they might be like, oh, that shouldn't be there. That shouldn't be there. But who cares? I'm getting married. Yeah. Exactly, I, I know that, that was kind of our, our, our wedding. We're like, hey, this should have done this. And we're like, who cares? You know, we, we couldn't wait to just go to the honeymoon anyway. Preach it, bro. That's what the Bible's here. That like Saint, uh, Jesus is looking at these guys. Is that these synagogue leaders were more concerned about his understanding about the law rather than the woman's life being turned around. Wow. They were on pick, nitpicking these little things, and they were running on it rather than this woman's life has just been changed. Here was a woman who had lived in discomfort and pain for 18 years. And in instead of rejoicing for her, celebrating her that she's been set free from her condition, and praising God for the healing, this man was upset that it wasn't it wasn't done uh, it was done on a certain day of the week. And sometimes we can have our heart like that. There's times where things are going around, we should just be praising God. It's time to praise God. See, we are called actually here in this scripture to match other people's joy and sometimes their sorrow. Um, but we need to learn, I think, how to celebrate the miracles and even the baby steps in each other's lives. Mm, yeah. We need to learn just to settle down and just praise God for things. Yeah. You know, have you ever been taught, like, in a relationship, if you want to someone to continue doing a behavior, you keep encouraging that behavior, mm -hmm. right? If they do the dishes or they do something that you like, oh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing this. When's the last time you did that spiritually for someone? Sister, I just want to thank you that you have a great prayer life. I want to encourage that. That's awesome. You're, you're, you encourage me. We should be rejoicing when people have great quiet times or they're getting closer to God. Rejoice and, and lift up people for that. Yeah. We should learn how to compliment people in their, in their spiritual behaviors and, and want to encourage them to keep doing that. Hey, I, I, you, you come out every time and share your faith. 
That's so encouraging. Yeah, I know we all do it. But I, I know there's days I don't want to share my faith. Mm. I'm grateful that you keep coming out. I think sometimes we look at each other like we're, we're obliged to keep being here. Any moment any person can leave this church. The, 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 mo the, the point that they're still here, we got to lift each other up. Yeah. We've seen people come and go. I'm so grateful that you're still here in the kingdom. Thank people for their prayers. Lift them up when they wake up early and have a quiet time. Tell them that the, the you've noticed their change or at least their effort to do so. Learn how to just simply praise God for the small things. See, Jesus described and compared this woman to a donkey or an ox, meaning the donkey or ox couldn't untie themselves, right? They needed someone else to do so. Sometimes we're focused way too much on the hero of the story than the victim that has been changed. Mm. Jesus wasn't using this as a way to get more followers. He might have used it in a little bit to kind of show the wickedness in the Pharisees' hearts of this man's heart, but he was focused on the victim. See, most movies, we, the God is focused on the hero, right? The guy who saves all the lives and everything. Jesus here, he was just focused on the helpless. He didn't care about the hero. He, he was just focused on how can I help people. And I think when we start to think about that, rather than the great things and the hero things, when someone is just being lifted up and growing just in small ways, that, that would change the momentum of this church. That would be encouraging. Every single time someone takes notice of the little things that you do, how encouraging would that be? Sometimes people don't like to be encouraged too much, but I understand that. But, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I think it would just be encouraging when we just start to notice our efforts. You know, everyone's doing the best that they can. Let's yeah. start to take notice of that. Mm -hmm. See, so we have to protect our hearts against the same temptations to feel the same way as this man. Times that we might be able to grow critical. When someone's leading a Bible study or a song or a prayer that we thought we should be leading. Mm -hmm. When someone is fruitful or has a better job or, you know, starts dating or gets married. Mm -hmm. When someone has too much of a pure heart, you know, well, they, they just don't understand. When you're a little critical heart, you know, <laughs> they, they, they just don't get it, you know. So get critical about that. When someone is mentioned in good news or a lesson and you haven't really been lifted up that long, uh, you haven't been lifted up in a long time. These are small ways that we can get critical. But instead, we have to adopt the heart of 1 Samuel 23, of, of, of Joshua's heart when he was looking at David. And we can just read in verse 16, actually. It says, uh, the Saul's son, And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. We love that scripture, but it's awesome what Joshua or Jonathan actually says to David. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be the king of Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. How cool is this? Is that Jonathan loved David so much that he was willing to give up the crown. The crown was his. Why was actually Saul trying to kill David most of, most of the time? Saul knew that David was going to have the kingdom. And so Saul, as quote-unquote a loving father, was trying to kill David so his son Jonathan could have the kingdom. That was one of his major motivations to try and kill David. Actually, he even tells Jonathan this. Don't you understand what you're doing? He's going to take the kingdom away from you. But Jonathan's heart, I'll give up the crown for you. Mm. See, the kingdom is not the Game of Thrones. <laughs> the kingdom is the game of, of thorns. Ooh. Okay. It's how can I take suffering from you and take it on myself so you can live a better life. Wow. That is how much we should be looking at each other. Mm. How much suffering can I relieve from my fellow brothers and sisters and rejoice in wow. their victories? See, the final challenge I have here, just for point two, is find something from each person's lives here that you can praise God for. Something small, big, doesn't really matter. In their family, whatever's happening, find something to praise God for in each other's lives. See, it reads here at the end of this interaction between Jesus and this woman. In Luke 13, verse 17. When he had said this, all his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. See, Jesus did not care if he was humiliating or upsetting people. All that he really cared was 
I just wanted to fix this woman's life. In the end, just like this woman, guys, we need to start believing the truth of God rather than the, says of life, uh, the lies of Satan. It is never too late to change. Don't believe that it's been too long or anything is permanent in your life. You have the ability to change. See, it is time to straighten out your life now. No matter how old or how long it's been crooked. It is time to praise God rather than looking at your for, uh, excuse me, it's time to praise God rather than looking for self-praise. How can I just find something to praise God for? And with that, to God be all the glory. Come on. Woo!